euh, organisé cet événement. Oups Cet, cet événement merveilleux. Donc, merci François. Et, euh, je voulais dire, oui. Donc, ben, nous, nous sommes arrivés. On était dans, dans, la, dans la deuxième année du bac. Euh, dans notre premier cours de, du, du volet approfondi du, du programme. Donc, un cours d'analyse et euh, Norbert était notre, notre professeur. Et c'était vraiment une révélation, d'abord par la qualité du cours qui était absolument étonnant, euh, mais aussi par cette espèce d'ouverture d'une perspective euh, sur le monde mathématique qui dépassait beaucoup les, les, les frontières de notre université et aussi, aussi de, 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 des mathématiques comme entreprise humaine. Donc, il y avait des gens qui les faisaient puis en parlait, puis c'était une liste peut-être, mais c'était une liste très intéressante, et puis euh, un, donc un sentiment d'appartenir, d'entrer de, de, dans, une, dans une communauté. Euh, il s'est beaucoup occupé de notre, notre carrière à tous, et puis euh, je, suis, je suis sûr qu'on a tous de, de, de très bons souvenirs de cette époque, et de plus tard, qui a continué de, de, nous, de nous suivre, nous, nous, euh, euh, nous aider. Euh, je suis peut-être de, de tout le groupe, le, le, celui qui leur... Euh... Pardon? Ah oh, oui, c'est vrai, on est tellement l'habitude <rire> que... <rire> on vous on aime, mais vous ne comprenez pas. OK. <rire> Alors... <rire> C'est peut-être moi qui, qui est le plus, euh, le plus redevable euh, à Norbert et à Dana, parce qu'ils ils étaient à sabbatique à Oxford ma, ma première année. Et euh, c'était une tradition pas, un petit peu dure par moment, parce que c est, c est, on, on passe à un autre niveau. On est euh, peut-être euh, on, on plus dans le, le, la norme que, que l'exception. Et puis, euh, disons, les, les, les deux ont m'ont beaucoup aidé et encouragé pendant cette année-là à faire le passage. Oui, oui, il y en avait deux, Donaldson et Francis Kerwin. Alors, maintenant, Sir Simon et Dame Francis. Alors, donc, euh, on, euh, tous les deux fort sympathiques, d'ailleurs. Euh, donc, c'est ça, je cherchais quelque chose... Euh, à présenter. Et puis, j'essayais quelque chose qui, qui peut-être donne une, une sorte de continuité à partir de ce moment-là et qui, qui, en fait, continue jusqu'à euh, jusqu tout récemment. Et donc, je vais parler du, du jeu ou de l'interaction de, de, de la théorie des, des, des variétés de drapeaux avec les objets que j'étudiais, qui sont des, essentiellement des, des champs de jauge tous les variantes des équations, de solutions des équations, Yang-Mills. Euh, donc, mais je vais commencer avec le, le, les choses de l'époque. And, and maybe I'll just switch to English. Um, so, monopoles in R3. So, the, the, the ingredients of these... Um, um, Well, the first thing is there's a, there's a vector bundle, which because we're on R3 is just trivial. And I'll be talking for, for things associated to SUN or UN. Um, so um, just a vector bundle over R3. Uh, it'll be equipped with a connection. Yes, yeah, a Hermitian method. Um, so it's a, uh, a way of taking a covariant derivative and you sort of package all of these derivatives together, taking all derivatives in all directions at once, and you can split off the um, components and have directional derivatives. Um, the third is a section, which will be a skew Hermitian section, but Um, which in some sense is the connection component in a sort of fictitious fourth direction. 
Um, the other thing it has is asymptotics. So the connection is asymptotically flat, <clears throat> just the ordinary derivative basically. And um, this Higgs field phi is, it, it'll be it'll be skew Hermitian, but I, I'm not going to emphasize that. But it, it's it's because it's it's in the Lie algebra of, of UN. But I mean it's it's not. This will do. Um, so the asymptotics are that I is diagonalizable, and um, it has sort of quantities which are in physics speaks thought of as masses and um, R of course is the radius in R3. And these things which turn out to be integers, and that's, that's forced by the equations, which is the fifth ingredient. Um, okay. Um, And um, so you could you could write it in components as uh, dx of phi is the commutator of dy and dz, and then you can just permute cyclically, or you can write it and encode it in a sort of complex version, which has the dx minus i phi. And there are probably signs that are wrong, but I'm asking for indulgence. And this basically is a sort of debar operator. So we should think of complex structures. Um, <clears throat> and if you look what Hitchin did, um, in studying these, he, he turned this thing into an object on an associated space, which is a sort of twister space. Um, so if you look at the oriented lines, Um, R3, so and they're, they're not through the origin, they're just lines. Um, this is, has a complex structure. In fact, it's the tangent bundle of the Riemann sphere. Okay, so how do you think of it? You've got a sphere of directions. There's a two sphere. Okay. Um, directions, and it's got a, uh, for each direction, you've got a plane. And the way this fits together is that it's the tangent bundle. And no, so now what you do um, is you, um, you solve for all L, the linear equation. So you've got a line and you've got a unit vector field along it. Du um, minus i phi of s equals zero. Um, so you have e tilde l is the space of solutions. Uh, you get a bundle uh, over. One, okay, E tilde. L is the line. The unit vector field along L, of course. Yeah, okay. Okay, so you're solving this, this equation. It's just an ODE, just about that. And the thing is, because of that commutation here, basically, you're seeing that it's, it's going to, uh, you'll have an integrable D-bar operator. And this thing is going to be holomorphic. And these equations, which were the, the Bogomolny equations, 
So I'll just call them the monopole equation. For nabla, um, well, for E, nabla, phi, get encoded. And there's a way of getting it back. It's sort of a geometric construction, uh, but it's the uh, Cauchy Riemann or holomorphic structure. Um, for e tilde. Okay, so that's the, the uh, there's an equivalence. And like I said, you can get back this, this geometric data. <clears throat> I'm skipping a few details, obviously. Okay. Um, so um, if you take the U1 monopole, where now um, Nabla is just the ordinary D and phi is just I, that's all you got. Um, you get a line bundle um, L on TP1. And it's an interesting line bundle. It's, it's extremely non-algebraic. That's a technical term, uh, which means that it, it, no matter how many poles and things you'd allow, it never has any sections. It's a fundamentally transcendent object. Um, <clears throat> and um, well, what about the next, the next group up? So Hitchin looked at SU2. And that's where you need these, look, start looking at these boundary conditions. So I just take the phi is uh, I times one minus whatever, um, K over two R minus one plus K over two R. So it's asymptotic to this. These are, these are all things arranged so everything's invariant under conjugation. Right? So you can just choose a gauge in which things are diagonal and, and integrate. So this is the, the, um, the thing. So just pretend it is this and solve nabla u minus i by s equals zero. And um, that's when you get, um, get solutions, right? You get solutions S1, S2 equals what? Um, well, you get a first set of solutions that looks like e to the minus x, x to the 2k, zero plus stuff. Or you get a second solution that's blowing up exponentially, right? So this one, let's, let's write out a little. So this one is, if you draw its graph, it's sort of going down to zero. And the next one, oops, eraser, eraser. Behind the laptop. Behind the laptop, oh, that's clever. Okay, good, thanks. Um, and the next one, the other one is, is gonna blow up, right? So S1 is behaving like this and S2 is blowing up. However, as I remember Hitchin pointing out to me at the time, uh, a line has two ends. <laughs> and so you get a second solution. Sort of going to minus infinity if you want, because these are oriented lines. Um, which is uh, decaying at minus infinity. So um, most solutions to this uh, will blow up. Some solutions, a set, an exceptional one dimensional set goes to zero, decays. Um, <clears throat> this is actually a theorem of Levinson's from the, the 30s. So this is a nice uh, sort of perturbations of those things with that asymptotics. Now you've got two ends. And so what this gives you for your, your geometry, if you've got your bundle E tilde, and you have a two sub bundles. 
And Hitchin identifies them in notation that I, I probably don't want to go into, but one is basically some sort of twist of this, this uh, bundle L, and that's the plus infinity. This is the minus infinity. And there are two quotients. So let's call this uh, e tilde one plus e tilde one minus, because they're rank one and these are the directions e tilde one plus and e mod e tilde one minus. Okay, so you've got this, this sort of picture of, of this thing is, is a, it's an extension of bundles, line, two bundle, line, line, two bundle, line, in two different ways. And generically, don't forget, you've got this sort of lump of charge in the middle of the R3. And so generically, and especially if you go out to infinity, where this thing is actually behaving very much like this, the two, these two decaying things are transverse. So you've got one line, the other line. And so on most of TP1, this, these, these two pictures are, are transverse. The, the, the E tilde is basically a sum of lines. And they coincide, E tilde one, um, so they're generically transverse. Um, coincide over S, which is a the spectral curve. of the monopole. So it's a, it's a Riemann surface, it's got a degree and things like that. It's sitting inside TP1. Okay, so you've got, here's TP1, and you've got this curve that's sitting inside. Okay, and then so Hitchin was able to show a whole bunch of things to this, about these things, and he uh, showed how this also encoded through another Transform it directly from the monopole involves looking at solutions to the Dirac equation in the background of the monopole and computing an index bundle and you get these, these equations. I'll come back to them later. But anyway, he was able to sort of derive a whole bunch of properties. And so as a dutiful student, I was, I was working my way through this um, and sort of rewrote it. And it's, it looks trivial and I thought so at the time, except it, it did help with calculations, but it turned out to be a, a good idea. So you can rewrite E tilde, right? So you've got E tilde. It's going to be sitting inside the sum of E on E1 plus on E1 minus. And there's going to be a quotient, which is E mod E1 plus, um, which is going to be equal to E mod E1 minus over the spectral curve. Okay, so what is this telling you? It's telling you these, you've got these two standard things here. They're completely fixed and they're determined by the asymptotics of the monopole, both the K and the line bundle L. You've got a spectral curve, which is the geometric object. And so it, it has, certain constraints, in particular, this bundle has to be isomorphic to this one. And that's all, well, no, there are more constraints. Anyway, they, they, but anyway, the spectral curve, just directly from this picture, uh, determines the, the monopole. And it's, it's a sort of nice picture, but it's, it, it, so you're getting that S determines a monopole. Um, you're getting some other stuff too, which is that um, the, um, it's a sort of direct link to um, what was the other sort of version or technique for solving these things, which are Tom's equations. So this, this quite amazing physicist, Werner Nam came up with these techniques for, again, uh, solving the, uh, the, um, 
monopole equations by looking at the, uh, the Dirac equations in the background of the monopole and you look at the set of solutions and you basically, um, in this picture, you're taking this whole object here and you're tensoring it by L to the T, which involves shifting the Higgs field. You're just adding a constant Higgs field, which is just I times T. Okay, so you're, you're uh, taking this picture. Nam's equations were, were um, they're ODEs. Uh, they correspond again to a, a reduction of the Yang-Mills equations, but to, to one dimension. And they're just uh, Ti dot Pk. Ti are um, A by K emission. Okay, so you're just getting um, obviously cyclically permuting one, two, and three. So um, three equations and some very peculiar boundary, boundary conditions. They have to blow up with a very peculiar pole at the end that has to be a the polar parts have to be a representation of SU2 and all sorts of stuff, but it's, it's a very strange object. And the point is that these, these are integrated um, from this uh, by Kritschever's method. So that was another thing that was very popular at the time, uh, showing that flows of line bundles on a, on a Riemann surface gave you a solutions to these, to various ODEs, but these included. <clears throat> and it turns out that if you write things in this way, you get a very clear uh, picture of both the NAM solutions and their boundary behavior, which was a, a rather mysterious thing. And the reason basically is that when you're shifting by LT, remember I said these bundles over TP1, over the curve, they're fine, but over TP1, they're, they're highly non-algebraic. But when you shift, uh, this by minus t, so minus one, uh, this becomes OK, which is the bundle lifted from P1. It's, it's totally algebraic, it has sections, has everything. So all of a sudden your, your solutions, your, your set of sections here, whoop, blows up, fills the space. And that imposes strong constraints on the boundary behavior, your flows and you're done. But it also, and this is perhaps most pertinent, also gives you a good picture on moduli. Okay. So a few years later, Donaldson showed that the, uh, the moduli are basically a uh, rational maps, So holomorphic maps from the Riemann sphere to itself. He does this by analyzing Nam's equation and basically like all the, the uh, a lot of rather the, the Yang Mills picture on, on manifolds that are, well, hypercalar, but have, so have three complex structures basically. So R4, um, and here it's R3, but there's this extra shadow R, R that's sort of sitting there. All of these things, um, the equation split into a sort of complex holomorphic bit, which solutions to which determine the modulus. It tells you which solution you've got. It tells you nothing about the solution, but it tells you which solution you've got. And then you have to solve, typically by some variational method, a third equation, which will tell you, yeah, you've got a solution. Uh, but again, um, because you've used variational techniques, you really don't know what the solution's like. Um, so you've got this complex solution where things are very easy to describe. You know it determines a solution uniquely. And um, it, uh, it completes to a, a you know it, it completes, it has to, to a full solution, but you don't know how. But you can still describe the moduli. And it turns out that in this picture, there's a very nice, sort of picture. So you've got P1 that's sitting here and you've got TP1 sitting above it. 
you choose a point. And remember, I said that this P1 of directions is basically secretly complex structures. Well, you choose a fiber of TP1 over P1. So this is, in R3, it's a plane. You're choosing a direction. So you've got your spectral curve sitting here. And over the, the uh, this, over this, this uh, base, over this line rather, you can, you're able to write, um, E is just the trivial bundle. So it's the fiber F, F cross C2. And you can normalize the minus fiber to F cross, I don't know, say zero cross C. So it's sitting there as the second coordinate in this, this bundle. So this is the minus. And then E1 plus is the, um, what is it? Well, it's the, um, it's a moving line in C2. Okay, so we've got this bundle here. You've got a sub bundle. As you're moving along the fiber, it's changing position. Okay, and if you projectivize, you think of these points of the intersection. Um, so you, you, sorry, you're taking F cross C2, you take its projection, pro projectivization, that's just F cross P1. Um, E1 minus is F cross infinity, and E1 plus is, uh, well, it's a, it's a function. It's map F to P1, whose poles. Remember, this is where E1 plus hits E1 minus, but otherwise it's elsewhere. So it's got a pole and that's, that's your rational map. In other words, from these, these bundles and a bit of exercise, you know, gymnastics, trivializing things and making things, you're getting from these two flags, the, first, the second one you're just normalizing and the first one is giving you your rational map. So it's a nice picture thing that uh, generalizes and turns into more complicated flag manifolds. Okay, so later on, uh, Michael Murray, and I were considering, um, well, S-U-N or U-N, doesn't matter. U-N monopoles. And you remember there was this, these eigenvalues in infinity that we'll just take to be distinct. Um, and so, so you've got eigenvalues infinity, which are, I don't know, um, u1, un, for phi. Imply, what do you get? Well, you get n decay rates. For d minus i phi. So you're getting flags and you've got, again, you've got two ends. And so you get uh, for E tilde, I think I'll drop the, uh, the tilde if you don't mind. Um, you'll get a flag E1 plus sitting inside E2 uh, plus. N plus, so E1 is the thing that decay fastest at a given exponential rate, say mu1. E2, well, it's the, the next rate over mu2, but as it's decaying less fast, E1 is sitting inside it and so on. You get flags like this and at the other end, you're getting that. Of course, the, the top space is the whole bundle. So, um, Fine. So the idea basically is to do the same thing we had up there with this. 
Um, I tried to write some things out ahead of time. Not much, but it, oops. good. And so you're getting that E will sit inside these successions of quotients like this. And again, this tells you a lot because these um, live on the curve. They're now N minus one spectral curve. So there's only a spectral curve S1, S2, Sn minus one. These are generically line bundles. They're not quite, they've got a little bit of twists. But again, all of this side is completely determined by the integers involved, the, these mu's, these quantities at infinity, and the geometry of these spectral curves. So everything is encoded by this. And this tells you what the monopole is. So again, the spectral curves and their intersection patterns, and again, the curves are constraint, they determine everything. Um, <clears throat> Well, now you can do as before and look at the moduli of the curves. So take this. Um, well, two things. First of all, for, for Nam's equations, it becomes very interesting because you're solving these things on different spectral curves. They have different degrees. And so you get these K1 by K1 matrices, K2 by K2. K3 by K3 on a sequence of intervals. And it, what it corresponds to, of course, is the, you've got a, a Dirac equation on space. You're shifting the eigenvalues at infinity. When those eigenvalues hit zero, the operator ceases to have an index. And so dimensions jump and things like this. But they're still sort of coherent enough by procedure, I still don't really understand uh, that there's good boundary conditions. In other words, you can get the, the NAM flow associated with this spectral curve, we'll pass it, pass on to this spectral curve, and pass on to this spectral curve. And it passes on precisely through these bundles. So they sort of go up here and then restrict to the next spectral curve. Because these spectral curves, of course, are distinct. And the only way they communicate with each other is, is through this space they're sitting in. So it's a nice picture. That's for NAM, but for the moduli, um, Um, well, again, restrict um, to um, a fiber f of p one. Um, you get e. Well, you get basically the flag e i minus trivial. So you normalize things so that the, one of the flags is trivial and the others, EI plus gives map F from this fiber F into the flag manifold. And, um, <clears throat> so again, these, these flags, um, and the theorem, of course, is these, 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 this determines the modulus. So the moduli of UN monopoles. Okay, so you're getting the, the moduli space just from this, these Flags. And again, the picture is that the, the restriction to the fiber gives you the, tells you what this, tells you, you there's one solution corresponding to this. Getting to the other is a variational process. We had to go through the, the, um, the solution to Nam's equations and analyze the flows and things like that. There's a student of Donaldson's in the 90s who did this directly. It's a beautiful thesis. I think he became a banker, which is <laughs> sort of sad. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so that's the, the picture for uh, <clears throat> picture for monopoles. Um, how am I doing? Uh, like uh, two minutes max. Pardon? Ça dépasse. 
Good. Okay. Um, there's a, an extension to what's called calorons. So these are, um, well, self dual Yang males are on S1 cross R3. And there it's the map, holomorphic maps of the Riemann sphere into the uh, loop cross magnet. So, and again, with various boundary conditions, you can get. Um, uh, meantime, the, the uh, on R4, you can also tie this to this time with a very special um, maximal parabolic here for the loop group. It's the loop group. So loops, loops on UN or loops on, yeah. Loops on G. Yeah. And then pushing it out by? A parabolic that, that also includes the sort of zero weight. So it-, it uh, This is a group of uh, actually- It's, it's, it's yeah, they, 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 they sort of- uh, the loop of the Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's um, I don't know how to describe it. They, they, they um, you know, the, the, uh, the parabolics for ordinary sort of G are, are characterized by a subset of the um, simple roots. Well, for the loop group, you have an extra root. And you have an extra, extra simple root, basically, and that, that one sort of added to it. Um, so it was the, the extended Dinkin diagrams of this morning were really for these, these affine things. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> this is the, the, uh, the original instantons. Okay, so, and so the question is, how can you describe them? And then there's this very nice sort of picture where, um, again, I, I'm just gonna use GLN and uh, the flag manifold will be GLN mod, uh, the case I'm worrying about is the Borel subgroup for these, these things. Um, so the Borel uh, subgroup is what, well, it's the, set of matrices that are upper triangular or the one for this particular case. And because this fixes, it's a homogeneous flag, all flags, GLN maps, any flag to any flag, this stabilizes one of them. And so you can write it as a quotient. And so um, you've got the sort of opposite nilpotent, unipotent group. Um, which has ones on the diagonal and stuff below with zero above. And this acts on this and it acts, its orbits divide the, the flag manifold into nice cells. There's one big cell and then there's some co-dimension one cells at infinity. And so, um, and, um, so there's a big cell at infinity. And so you can think of a map Holomorphic map into G mod B as a meromorphic map into N. Okay, so you've got a map here and it's going around this, and this is the image of the map. Now its poles will be where it hits these cells at infinity. And this cell corresponds to the first spectral curve, the second spectral curve and so on. Okay, so you get a picture, basically, if you think of P1, you can write F of Z as a sum, AI over Z minus BI, if the poles are distinct, if they're not, you know, there's another expression, but you can write it as a sum of principal parts. And this means that you can describe the same picture here, you can describe a map into the flag manifold by giving a configuration of principal parts. You say where in the, in the Riemann sphere they land, and you say, well, you pres prescribe essentially the residue 
at each of these points. So it's, it's a more complicated picture, of course, you can meet both strata at once and so on, but it's, it's still a sort of similar idea. Now this has a very nice consequence. It basically tells you a lot about the topology because your, your space of maps, so your spaces of instantons, your calorons, the whole batch basically get described as configurations of labeled particles in the plane. And well, maybe another link to Norbert, a very nice 1960s topology. Uh, May, Milgram, a whole bunch of other people um, developed the, the tools for handling these things. There's an enormous algebra, and there's basically saying that if you're going to describe a cycle in dimension k, you need at most two k points. And it's sort of logical because the first thing you might do is to take two poles and have them turn around each other, and that gives you a circle. Well, that one turns out to be trivial in this case, but in any case, you're seeing there's a sort of an accountancy of points. And what it means is the topology of these spaces of configured particles stabilize under adding a point, a labeled configuration, add in one. And that gives you a, a way of seeing um, the stability of these moduli spaces, which was this Atiyah Jones conjecture, which was the, the sort of story. So it's all amounts to label, but you do it for all of these things and it's essentially the same story. So there's this joke about a mathematician who somebody knows a trick and a great one knows two, but I have no pretensions to greatness, but I, I know one trick and this is, this is, I've just given you my trick. Uh, it came to light recently also because a colleague in Arizona was looking at uh, instantons on a, Tau nut manifold, and I thought, well, we should do it. But you can actually use this this idea no, also. It no, it's it's Sergei Cherkis. Involved in all these sort of mysterious that's things that's like Coulomb branches and. Hmm? Oh, I'm, I'm done. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose cycling back to uh, all this you? topology. <laughs> yeah, it was about time you shut me up. Anyway, <laughs> the, the, uh, anyway, yeah, it's it's the monopole. The original Dirac monopole just has a, a singularity of the origin, basically in R three, okay, yeah. and it's it's a simple expression. Okay. The the non abelian gauge groups allow you for smooth solutions. And that mm -hmm. was a, that was a bit of a surprise, basically. But and the, and the, the, the in the, for the abelian one, if you want a non trivial solution, yeah. apart from the silly one I wrote. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, it's you, you have the singularity, and that's that's direct that, solution. That's the, yes, have just and it's it's a unit of magnetic charge, and basically that that magnetic charge is this bundle mm -hmm. is now over R three minus the origin, mm -hmm. and it's a first train class. Mm -hmm. That's the charge, uh -huh. yes. and so that that was his explanation of quantization. Yes. yes. So. And uh, why the word instanton actually? There, there's a very hilarious thing. To there was a conference in the 1980s about monopoles, and you know, Dirac was still alive, and. They, would you, would you like to come, Professor Dirac? And then he said, well, no, I'm too old, et cetera. And, like, and, and in this very typical Dirac way, he said, uh, wish you good luck with all the conferences. By the way, I'm now inclined to believe that monopoles don't exist. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> that's rather nice. <laughs> yeah. Could you say where the word Caleron comes? Yeah. No. <laughs> that was the next question. <laughs> I haven't a clue. But who coined it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>